My name is Dr. Jane Yardley. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Alberta Augustana faculty. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the ups and downs of exercise with type 1 diabetes. By the end of this presentation, I'm hoping you'll be able to describe the difference between aerobic and anaerobic exercise to explain potential insulin dosage adjustments and carbohydrate intake for different types of exercise, and maybe to provide some non-insulin or carbohydrate recommendations for preventing lows and highs with exercise. To start, let's have a look at exercise metabolism. Where do the fuels come from? Where are they stored? And when are they used? The first thing to keep in mind is that just about anything that you eat can become a fuel for your body. It gets broken down into carbohydrate, lipid, and protein. All of these can be used to create something called adenosine triphosphate, which is basically the energy currency for muscle contraction. These fuels are stored in various places in the body. Fats are stored in adipose tissue. So anything that's soft and squishy is basically where you're storing your fat. There's also a little bit stored in the muscle, and this can be used as a fuel source during endurance activities. And there's usually a tiny bit in the blood. And this is often in transit, either coming from the gut to go to one of the storage areas or going from one of the storage areas for, to the muscle for fuel. Carbohydrates are generally broken down into glucose and then get stored as glycogen. And you can see here that the vast majority of that ends up in the muscle. It's important to remember that once it goes to the muscle, it can't leave. It's essentially locked in place and then it can only be used for muscle contraction. When it goes to the liver, it can come back out again afterwards when the conditions are right. That can be released from storage to help prop up blood glucose levels when they drop. And you'll see that there's a very, very small amount of glucose that actually stays in the blood. We usually use the analogy of a teaspoon of sugar in about five liters of blood. It's a very small amount and it's usually kept in a very tight balance. In terms of exercise itself, we tend to class things as aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic exercise is usually rhythmic and repeated uh, using the big muscle groups. So things like walking, swimming, cycling, dancing, these are all examples of aerobic exercise. And to keep them on the aerobic end of the exercise spectrum, we say that you need to be able to sing or talk while you're doing the activity. All of these activities can also become anaerobic if you increase the intensity enough. So anaerobic activities are ones that are very high intensity. And if we want them to be purely anaerobic on that really high intensity end, they tend to only last a matter of seconds. And as a result, we can often perform them intermittently with some rest or uh, lower intensity activity recovery in between. Example of anaerobic activities would be things like sprinting, weightlifting, or other explosive movements, uh, like uh, plyometrics would be another example of a type of training that's used often for sport. The important hormones when it comes to managing energy and glucose in general during exercise and at rest, well, insulin's gonna be the first one. <clears throat> this hormone helps store glucose in the muscle, in the liver, and also in fat cells. When it's naturally produced, it has a very short half-life. What that means is that the insulin in the body is constantly being replaced and degraded so that when there is an adjustment needed for the amount of insulin to be in circulation, it can go up or down fairly quickly. The half-life is in the matter of minutes, which means that minutes from now, half of the insulin in my body will be gone and it will be replaced by new insulin if I need to keep those insulin levels high. When we put it in the context of synthetic insulin, the half-life is quite a bit longer. Here we're talking hours. And so that means that it can take several hours for insulin levels in circulation to change. And that becomes important when we start looking at the context of exercise. Glucagon, on the other hand, helps release energy from storage. And mostly here we're talking about glucose being released from the liver. And the last hormone that's really important is epinephrine, otherwise known as adrenaline. And this is a survival thing that allows us to um, access fuels in large quantities often during an emergency or during really high intensity exercise, because that is viewed as a major stress on the body. Now, if we look at the different types of exercise, 
in terms of intensity, and we look at the different types of fuels, we can see that there's a difference in the sources that the body wants to tap into during these activities. On the left here, you can see that fat is actually the primary source of fuel, which surprises a lot of people because we do know that with type 1 diabetes, there's usually a big drop in blood glucose levels during aerobic exercise. The reason for that is that glucose is actually the secondary source of fuel for this type of activity. And you'll notice that you're not actually going to be using any of those large storage areas. You're, you're just taking that glucose from the blood that teaspoon of sugar in five liters of blood. And this is why we see blood glucose levels drop really quickly. Now, if we're talking about high intensity exercise, then we're tapping into the muscle glycogen, the liver glycogen. That's 99% of what your body has stored in terms of glucose. And this is the reason why with high intensity activities, we don't usually see blood glucose levels dropping quite as quickly. And if we do see a drop in glucose levels, oftentimes it's after exercise because whatever we take out of glycogen to fuel these activities, it needs to be paid back. If we want to look at it in terms of what's supposed to happen with insulin and glucagon and glucose, if the pancreas is working properly, insulin usually drops pretty quickly at the start of exercise. This is because the nervous system detects that there's movement happening or is you know causing that movement um, <clears throat> and influences the pancreas to slow down the release of insulin. When that happens, it stops the, and, um, the blocking of, of glucagon, because when there's a lot of insulin out, glucagon can't be released. And here we see that there's a really big ratio of glucagon to insulin during exercise. And that usually ensures that glucose is being released enough from the liver to make sure that you've got uh, stable glucose levels for up to 90 minutes to two hours of exercise. If we look at this in the context of type 1 diabetes, because we know that that synthetic insulin lasts way longer, we often don't see a change in insulin during exercise. And sometimes we actually see an increase because there's more uh, blood flow to the skin and it causes that absorption to speed up. And when that happens, it actually prevents glucagon from being released because the cells in the pancreas are right next to one another and it's an antagonistic relationship. And high insulin usually means that it's going to stop that glucagon release. So what we end up seeing then is a, a big drop in glucose during exercise with aerobic activity. But as soon as we add anaerobic activity, it often slows that down. And this was a really nice study performed about seven years ago where the same group of participants came back to the lab twice and performed 60 minutes of exercise. And what you can see right away, we'll just put these up here, is a big drop in glucose during that, uh, that gray bar that we can see, the one that drops all the way down there, that is just straight running, treadmill running at a straight intensity for 60 minutes. But this one up here at the top where it says the Loughborough Intermittent Shuttle Test, here the participants jogged a little bit, ran a bit harder, walked a little bit, threw in some sprints. Um, it's a test that involves a lot of different intensities, but definitely throws in some very high intensities uh, in that cycle. And you can see that there's a much smaller drop in glucose as soon as you start adding those high intensity activities. What does this mean for adjusting insulin and taking carbohydrates around exercise? I'd first like to point out that all of the recommendations that are listed in this presentation come from this one paper that was published in 2017. If you have not seen this paper, it's easy to access. Uh, you just need to make a free account for yourself at the Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology, and then you can access this paper free of charge. And it has a lot of recommendations for what to do during different types of exercise, and it describes why you want to do those changes. First off for insulin, what this publication recommends is that if you're using multiple daily injections, that the basal rate can be, or the basal dose, sorry, can be reduced by 20% before exercise, if exercise isn't happening on a daily basis. It can also be considered to decrease the post-exercise basal dose by 20%. Um, and if there's bolus insulin taking prior to exercise, if there's a snack or anything, um, that that bolus insulin can also be decreased, or in some cases, perhaps even eliminated. 
With insulin pumps, we have really good evidence to show that if the basal rate is decreased 90 minutes to two hours before exercise, that it does a very good job of slowing down those drops in blood glucose during exercise. Those reductions can vary from 50% to 100%. We know that disconnecting the pump or turning it down to zero uh, for insulin infusion is safe for up to an hour. Uh, but there might be a requirement to provide a little bit of a bolus when reconnecting to prevent highs after exercise. There's also the possibility of decreasing the nocturnal basal rate post-exercise in order to prevent those overnight lows. With bolus insulin, if you're going to snack before exercise, the closer to exercise, the less of a reduction you need, and that's just about the amount of time that it takes to get into circulation. Um, 30 minutes before exercise, a 25 to 50% reduction with a snack. 60 minutes before exercise, a 50 to 75% reduction. These, again, are just recommendations. Everyone's a little bit different, and sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error to find the formula that works for you. With hybrid closed-loop systems, so these are the uh, pumps that have an auto mode on them, we know also that that exercise mode, the temporary target needs to be set 90 minutes before exercise, just like using a regular insulin pump. <clears throat> the importance of making these adjustments in advance were, was really nicely demonstrated in this publication by a group out of Montreal. And what they did, if we look at the um, right-hand side here, reduction at T minus 40, they had the participants decrease their basal rate on their pumps 40 minutes before exercise. T minus 20 meant 20 minutes before exercise, and T zero was right at the beginning of the exercise, they turned down the pump. And this is called a survival curve. And what it is, is when people are all at 100, that means that nobody's had hypoglycemia. Each time you see a step down, that means another participant has had to stop exercising due to hypoglycemia. And what we can see from all of this is that none of these options, 0, 20, or 40, none of these options were able to prevent hypoglycemia in 100% of the participants after that 20 to 25 minute mark. T minus 40 was a bit more successful, but even with that 40 minutes in advance, we're seeing about 30% of the participants having to stop because of hypoglycemia. Where carbohydrate intake is concerned, um, aerobic exercise up to 60 minutes in duration, the recommendation is to start with blood glucose levels between seven and 10 millimoles per liter, and that um, carbohydrate might not be required if insulin adjustments have been made well in advance. For anything more than 60 minutes, you can plan for 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Over 150, we have to be a bit more ambitious, maybe 60 to 90 grams per hour. And if this exercise is happening when there is high insulin circulating, uh, meaning shortly after a meal and we've had that full prandial bolus, um, then it may be necessary to take even more carbohydrate than that to prevent hypoglycemia. <clears throat> With the hybrid closed loop system, so if you've got that pump in auto mode, having a snack, um, Try to do that right before starting exercise so that your exercise starts before the rise in blood glucose starts. Because if your automatic system detects that glucose is going up, it will try to give you more insulin, and then that's going to increase the risk of going low during exercise. <clears throat> the higher the intensity, uh, the more likely the, the post-exercise lows. So nocturnal hypoglycemia is obviously something that we're very concerned about with late day high intensity activity. The recommendations here for the exercise sessions themselves, that uh, there may not be a requirement to reduce insulin dosage during the activity itself. This is extremely individual. Everyone's a bit different. It's going to depend on the duration and the intensity of the activity. Uh, if it's fairly intense and fairly short, um, adjustments might not be necessary during exercise, but it's often a good idea to consider basal dose reductions post-exercise while those gly glycogen stores are being replenished. With the pump and the um, whether it's on auto mode or not, again, reductions might not be required, um, but that post-exercise reduction uh, in basal dose or basal uh, rate could be a good idea for using an insulin pump. Uh, if you're on a closed loop system, it will probably make that adjustment automatically when in auto mode. 
As for bolus insulin, the recommendation as of now is that if you're snacking before exercise, when it's going to be high intensity, um, it's possible to give your full bolus and not have too many difficulties. In terms of feeding that type of activity when it's high intensity, Currently, the recommendations are that the starting blood glucose levels can be a little bit lower. And this is because we do see a lot of people actually having glucose levels go up during intense exercise, um, especially if it's done in a fasted state. So first thing in the morning, and I'll get to that again in a, a minute. If it's um, longer than 60 minutes, again, there may be a requirement for carbohydrates here. Uh, but what's most important is to make sure that once the activity is done, that there's enough glucose coming into the body, that those glycogen stores can be replenished. Um, so they say that a good uh, meal with 45 to 65% carbohydrate post-exercise is advisable after a high intensity exercise bout. There's also the possibility of having a low glycemic index bedtime snack, uh, which means something that's going to really slowly into the system and try and keep those glucose levels stable overnight. What if you don't want to eat carbohydrates and you don't want to adjust your insulin? Well, there are a few things that you can do that may help prevent drops in glucose during exercise. One thing is to play around with exercise order. What we've seen in some studies is that if high intensity exercise is performed right before aerobic exercise, that it can actually slow the drop in glucose during that aerobic exercise. And that's exactly what we see, see here. We had participants do 45 minutes of weightlifting, which is the dark circles up top before doing 45 minutes of running. And you can see there's even a slight increase in glucose when the run starts um, and it drops um, about 30 minutes, 45 minutes into this run. Whereas if this person had, or these participants, when they started with just running first, there was a big drop in glucose right off the bat. Um, and then it was stabilized a little bit more by that weightlifting afterwards. So playing around with exercise order, if you're starting your exercise session and your glucose levels are a bit higher than you would like, um, maybe the aerobic exercise portion could come first. And if you're starting and they're a little bit lower and you're on that borderline between, should I have some carbohydrates or should I just see how it goes? Um, maybe starting with that higher intensity exercise first could help stabilize things for a little bit longer over time. Of course, all of these recommendations come with that warning to Keep an eye on your glucose levels. Um, if you're using a CGM, check often. Uh, and if not, uh, make sure that you're using your glucometer to check from time to time to make sure you're in a safe exercise zone. A final recommendation, <clears throat> and this is one that has been getting a bit more attention lately, is to do your exercise in a fasted state. It almost seems counterintuitive to think, if I haven't eaten anything, do I really want to exercise? But what we've learned about type 1 diabetes and exercise is that when um, people have fasted overnight and go into exercise, there seems to be a tendency for glucose levels to go up rather than down. And here we've got two studies showing this where the fasted exercise are the open squares. Um, on the left, this is a study with weightlifting. On the right, it's a study with high intensity intervals. And you can see pretty clearly that with morning exercise, glucose goes up for most people, whereas the same people doing the same exercise at the same intensity in the afternoon are experiencing drops in glucose. And a lot of that has to do with just having less insulin in circulation in the morning. If you're doing your exercise before you've made any um, adjustments to your insulin, before you have had, had anything to eat, there's no bolus insulin on board. Um, there's actually a tendency at that time of day to also have higher cortisol and growth hormone, which are two other hormones that help uh, regulate fuel selection during exercise. Um, and it probably causes a bit more of a reliance on fat during these activities than carbohydrate, which may play a role in sparing some of that glucose. One thing to keep an eye out for with fasted exercise is that we do see pretty consistently high blood glucose levels after exercise. So there might be a need for some um, adjustments, some bolus um, insulin after the exercise. Hopefully that's given a few ideas on ways that exercise can be managed.